function. Okay, today I am going to present a joint work with uh, Giacomo De Palma, who is professor in uh, mathematics in the University of Bologna. And in particular, uh, I'd like to present some results about the training dynamics of uh, quantum neural networks, so a sort of generalization of classical neural network to the quantum setting. And first of all, just to fix the conventions, the notation, and to record the basic notion of uh, classical and also quantum, this is a general setting, machine learning, I will just define the supervised learning problem. So we are considering uh, uh, a set of example sampled from a unknown function, from an input space to an output space. And we want to uh, consider a class of function, of uh, candidate function, uh, to, uh, to try to approximate this G, to uh, simulate this G, uh, trying to fit this uh, training set. And this can be done uh, introducing a cost function. So the error we are making with one of the functions in, in this set, which are labeled uh, by <coughs> set of parameters. And so uh, we want to see that if at the end of the training, uh, the model, the specific uh, function select, will be able to um, generalize the training set and then retrieve the original function. So just as an example, we could have a set of pictures with some labels. So X is the picture, Y is the label. We uh, choose a random function in that set. So the random function will not be able at the beginning probably to, to give the correct label, label. But then by minimizing the error, uh, and this is a time evolution of the parameter, at the end we'll be able to fit the training set uh, and maybe to uh, generalize the example to new picture which are not in the training set. So <coughs> the same thing, but what could be the problems in this, um, with this procedure is that and in particular in the case of classical neural networks. Well, first of all, the, um, the function to be minimized could be not convex. And so uh, using a gradient flow, gradient descent training, well, could um, have some problems such as local uh, minima, not uh, allowing for the, a perfect fit of the examples. Uh, and furthermore, supposing to have reached the uh, global minimum, this global minimum could not be, uh, I mean, good enough, could not be zero, zero error. For instance, if we consider this uh, generating model G and we try to fit it using a linear function, then we are not able to get zero error. So uh, a strategy could be in a classical neural network, to consider the limit of infinite width. So uh, sending to increasing the number of parameters, so uh, sending to infinity uh, the number of uh, qubits for each layer. So having more parameters, we have more degrees of freedom. But then as a consequence, there is another risk, the one of overfitting. So this model could be able to perfectly fit the training set. But then what about the generalization? B, telling me. I mean, strongly oscillating, oscillating. But it was uh, more or less recently proved that uh, these problems do not happen in the case of classical neural network in the limit, uh, in this particular limit, because uh, the training is successful. Uh, the training set can be perfectly fit, and there is no uh, overfitting. So uh, what about the quantum case? So let me define the problem we're going to, to consider when we introduce quantum in these settings of machine learning. Sorry, sorry. could you go back one slide? Yes. <coughs> so are you saying that none of these three problems actually occur? Yeah, in the case, yeah, yeah. In Provably case. so, or is this some sort of heuristic? Uh, no, 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 there is a, there are rigorous proof 
uh, of this uh, of this fact, yes, that there is no. So, in fact, that uh, the, the cost goes to zero exponentially fast in time. So, uh, the fact that there is no overfitting is due, uh, and as we will see also for the quantum uh, case, due to the fact that the since we have a random initialization, we will have a distribution probability over the function generated by the network. So this distribution probability is a Gaussian process, so a really regular distribution probability over function. And so we have not oscillation. So the, the, when the number of parameters go to infinity, uh, there is a well-defined limit. And so then the, the prediction of this limit will depend on the properties of this Gaussian process. But surely there will be cases where a neural network does not does not repeat them. So I'm sure you can cook up examples where it does not No, no, no. We are, if we consider, if we consider a finite number of, of, uh, of uh, that requires some requirements in your training set, right? But you just. It is fixed for the moment, yeah. Yeah, but it needs to be like uh, properly the, yeah, expressive the, for the entire set, yeah. because otherwise. Yeah, the, the assumption, sure the, the typical regime is that uh, of. Uh, over parameterization that is, is considered in this case is that the number of parameters is much larger than the number of examples. Could you state more precisely what is the result of this? Yeah. Like what are the assumptions and what is, what is the statement? The assumption, so uh, we will see more in detail this also for the quantum case and yeah, there I will, I will state precise results. But the statement is just that, um, so, um, The assumption is to consider a classical neural network with a random parameters. Some assumption on the probability distribution of the parameters at the beginning is that they are IID. Uh, they are simplest cases when they are Gaussian with uh, uh, variance scaling with the number of fields. So there are some, some assumption of the distribution, but typically Gaussian is enough, but also in some cases, you could consider uh, identical distribution and not more something in specific distribution. Uh, the number of layers is fixed. Then we send each uh, number of layer for each uh, each number of uh, neurons for each layer. So the number of parameters to infinity, uh, and we see that. Uh, the distribution at each initialization is a Gaussian process with mean zero and covariance defined by the nonlinear function, nonlinear activation function, activation function chosen for the network. And then um, during the training, the statement is that in this limit, only in this limit, which is not considering the finite size correction. Are you talking about a particular learning algorithm? Because there's many ways to train a neural network. Uh, Gradient uh, uh, flow, gradient flow with a mean squared error. This specifically learning algorithm. So and then it is a Gaussian process with mean and covariance that can be computed at each time step. And this mean and covariance does not depend on the specific uh, initial parameter in the stream. So, so the, the result is independent of the initialization. This is more or less. So, so if the integrity of the space becomes complex, if you just add uh, parameters, yes. Yeah, but we will see. Uh, we yeah, we yeah, will yeah. see the, the, the shape of the cost function as an intuitive shape. If you go and plot that, no, no, no. Uh, I mean, the number of parameters going to infinity. So, but yes, but the idea will become clear uh, for the case of. Of quantum neural network, which are mathematically similar in the strategy, but then, of course, the function is different. So we will see. Uh, so we are considering the case of uh, mm, classical input and output, but the model that uh, we are using is the output of a quantum circuit. In particular, we consider a system initialized with a fixed state a uh, unitary evolution of this system uh, encoding both the parameters and the input using uh, parameterized gates. Uh, 
And then at the end, we fix an observable. So the only uh, quantity which is trained is, uh, is the parameter, the set of parameters. And a fixed observable, and what we do is to compute at the end the expectation value, this is a measurement of the observable, uh, of uh, the output of the measurement of the measurement. So this will be our model function that we will consider one to train. So as I said, the, the parameters are randomly initialized because we want to make a really general answer that we, you know, we don't want to make a strong assumption of the, on, about G, the unknown function. And the question is, will the training be successful in the, in the, in the quantum case, the setting? So more precisely, our model will be uh, that expectation value with a normalization because, uh, um, well, when we consider M, which is the number of qubits going to infinity, then we will need to somehow renormalize this and we will see why with a simple example. The observable is a sum of single qubit observable. This choice is not, uh, it is relevant because there are some, some examples in which uh, the observable is different and the training is not uh, as efficient as in the classical case, meaning that the convergence is not exponential in time to zero of the cost. So we define this local expectation value fk. And we also define the layer, this is just a definition of the number of layers. In this way, in each layer, we encode uh, parameters and we uh, encode also the input, making the qubit interact in a way that each qubit can interact at most with another one qubit, no more than another one in each layer. If you want to make other interaction, you compute to use other layers. So, uh, yeah, this is a, a, an example. First layer, uh, second layer, third layer. And we, I, I will introduce a um, couple of definitions, uh, which uh, I will use uh, often later. Uh, so the first one is the future icon of a parameter, which is just the set of observable depending on that specific parameter, okay? And uh, M will be the maximal cardinality of this uh, set for any architecture. So we first pick an architecture and then we compute M. And uh, the past icon of uh, any uh, observable will be the set of the parameters uh, on which that observable depends. And then will be the maximum. So the idea is just, uh, first of all, to understand if there are some bounds on uh, made by this light cone about the number of qubits and so the Hilbert space required to compute this observable because um, since we are computing the asymptotic limit of a large number of qubits, uh, if this uh, local Hilbert space, so just the space of qubits required to compute O3, for instance, if this is uh, growing just polynomially with the number of qubits, then we could try to simulate it classically and so the same computation on a classical computer. It's not what we are looking for. So we can see that there are some, some bounds and in order not to trivialize this bound, we ask that the, the past light cone grows at least uh, super logarithmically, the number of qubits. And this means that in our circuit, we are considering a number of layer, which is a function of the number of qubits, qubits is increasing because there are some works uh, fixing the number of layers. But then if the number of layers is uh, fixed, then the local liberal space has dimension, which is order of one with respect to the number of qubits. If we consider a lattice of uh, a two-dimensional lattice of qubits, a logarithmic group could be, could be sufficient to have a non-trivial bound here. And so not having a trivial strategy to compute the output of the series. Okay, 
So the first step, as I said, is the random initialization of the circuit. And as we just seen, the model function is a sum of some local terms. And we know uh, by the center limit theorem that in the really simplified case in which we have a sum of IID random variables, uh, summing them and using an appropriate normalization, we can compute the distribution of uh, uh, the sum when m goes to infinity, and we know that it, it is a Gaussian distribution by the center limit here, and we know expectation bar, uh, the variant of this distribution. But what about our case? Our case is uh, more complicated because, uh, well, first of all, this is just a technical fact. We have to de define a Gaussian distribution for a function, so for an infinite set of random variables because the index is x, it's not i. So, okay, it's just a, a technical issue. The real problem is that now fk is the qubit can interact and it can and keeps observable depend on many parameters and other observable uh, depending on other uh, parameters and maybe the same. So these, uh, these uh, terms are not independent as random variables uh, due to the distribution of theta. And so we cannot trivially apply this statement to our case. So uh, the, first, uh, the first issue is that we can use this definition for the generalization of Gaussian distribution to um, function. So a Gaussian process is just a set, a collection, which could be infinite of uh, random variables, uh, such that whenever we consider a finite subset of this uh, family, the distribution of this uh, finite subset is a jointly Gaussian distribution and the mean and the covariance of the, this uh, distribution is uh, fixed by a uh, general covariance mean function common for the Gaussian process. The Gaussian process is characterized by these two functions. So uh, the idea is that now, if we call f of x the random variable and x in the, is the index of the variable, then we have this generalized definition of Gaussian distribution for functions. So the second problem, as I was pointing out before, if we consider in this picture, OK and OK plus 4, we see that uh, there are some uh, common parameters on which both depend. And therefore, these, the two random variables, fk and fk plus 4, are not independent. So what we could do is to uh, build a sort of dependency graph. So uh, a graph uh, with vertices, uh, the label of the observables and edges, the, of the couple of observables not being independent. How can we do this? Uh, well, we consider one observable, we construct the past light cone for each element in the past light cone, we construct the future light cone. And therefore, we know that uh, uh, we just need to add to our uh, dependency graph uh, all the green observables together with the blue one. So for instance, this could be the dependency graph for this circuit, as, as you can notice. This is the dependency graph for the central limit theorem. Every random variable is independent. This is the opposite case. <laughs> Every random variable being mutually dependent. So this graph looks somehow more similar to the first one rather than the second one. And uh, there is a, a technical statement uh, to uh, bound the non-Gaussianities of the, su of the sum defined before, so in terms of the cumulants of this distribution, using the maximal degree of this graph. So 
uh, as long as this maximal degree is bounded with respect to the normalization introduced before, we can uh, bound the non-Gaussianities and then in the limit of an infinite number of qubit, these bounds can uh, become zero. So I will just state the, the result without. So could you go back? Yes. Is the intuition somehow like uh, essentially the theorem is this empty graph? Is yes. Is? yes. And like when you take the limit of the, the width of the circuit to infinity, yeah. then like your, your graph will be extremely sparse and so mm -hmm. it looks more like a problem. Yes. Than a yes, yes. So uh, there will be many, many observables which uh, are dependent. Mm -hmm. As long as sufficient part. Yeah, so here we have a geometrically local circuit. This is not an assumption of our work. But you see, in these cases, precisely this if it is far enough, then if it is not geometrically local, then far. Is, that's not a particular meaning, but in this case, yes, is, is this. The idea is and this one. So the first result is that choosing the normalization uh, in a way that in the limit of an infinite number of qubits, the, the covariance of these uh, random variable, not necessarily Gaussian, could be finite, so trivially zero or infinite. And square root of m is one possibility, but there are not in every case. In the case of independent uh, random variables, yes, it's enough, but it be different. So uh, assuming that this graph is sparse enough, so this is the, the construction done before. Uh, the, the maximal degree of the graph is mm, small enough with respect to the normalization. Uh, then the model at the initialization will convert the distribution to a, a Gaussian process with mean zero and covariance k. So now we have to train this model. We, Sorry, we, one second. This is kind of limiting the number of layers, right? Like, the, number of the, layer, the number of layers? The number of layers is a function of M. So is, at the end, will be. So say there's more, like if you have more layers than qubits, then everything is dependent, right? Yes. According so, to, depends on the interaction. But yes. So I, as I was uh, suggesting before, one choice could be logarithmic growth. And in this case, you see uh, that you okay. cannot uh, have this problem. Yes. Is it really sparsity that you should care about, or is it the tolerability? So, so the chromatic number of the graph seems to be is more important than than, than the, the sparsity. You want you want independence, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the the, the thing we are uh, taking care about is just uh, the fact that the degree, the maximal degree of this graph, is bounded. So this is the real requirement. Here, so yeah, that, so you can use the degree to bound uh, the chromatic number of the graph. But it's, so that's it seems like a stronger assumption than what you might need, right? You, you, use, you only need very few colors to color. The <coughs> class, each color class is a big independent set. Okay. Uh, not, yes. Not really enough for, mm -hmm. for the chromatic number to be too small. Uh, I mean. Uh, this assumption, uh, so I don't know if I am answering your question, but so this strategy is very generic because we are not considering a specific architecture. And so uh, we are trying to ignore just the, the specific structure internal and give a are really general, so the, the maximal degree could not be the best way of uh, of bounding uh, the non-Gaussianities. So if just we consider one qubit interacting, all the other one is doing just one, and its contribution will be its contribution will be zero at, at, at yeah. the end when we consider. So fictitiously, uh, the the the, the, the 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 degree goes to infinity, but this is and is a uh, it's not. Uh, small enough, but this is just a fictitious assumption. So the idea is that if we want to relax this hypothesis, we have to fix a specific architecture and then see what happens in, in that case. Mm -hmm. 
So what about the training? There are, so this is the physical training, so in the same step, but we will discuss it later. Now, just to simplify, we will consider the gradient descent, uh, sorry, the gradient flow. And as I pointed out before, there could be many problems. Now I will just show the solution. So the shape uh, of, of the cost function at the end that we will prove uh, in a moment. So, so with high probability, the training is successful, meaning that a global minimum will be reached exponentially fast in time. And there is also a peculiarity, which is um, lazy training. This global minimum is really close to the initial point. So the displacement, the parameters, uh, as the number of qubit increases, will become infinitesimal. So why do the model fit the training set if the displacement is infinitesimal? Well, because the number of parameters is going to infinity. And therefore, it is a sum of a, an infinite sum on an infinitesimal displacement. And therefore, the, the result is finite. This is the heuristic ex uh, explanation. Yeah. Sorry, I missed your question. But like, what about these barren plateaus that come up when you have lots of qubits, right? You mean, uh, sorry? Barren plateaus? Barren plateaus, yeah. yeah. Like, why yeah you... uh, so <laughs> I was skipping this. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> OK, sorry. You sorry. right into my trap. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So the fact that this is a really important question to consider <coughs> because when I was introducing this um, normalization in the model, uh, so it is possible to prove there is a proof in, in, in the paper that having a uh, so <coughs> small, ex in exponentially small in the number of qubit gradients of the, uh, the functions of the cost. Yeah, maybe it's worthwhile just saying what bare plateaus are. Uh, yeah, when, 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 <laughs> adding the picture that, 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 that they were showing here. So when the cost landscape is really flat, exponentially flat uh, in the number of qubit, then the training uh, is very hard because uh, so here we have an exponentially small uh, quantity in number of qubits, so we have to compute it with a, an exponentially large number of measurement of the, the circuit, and then training is extremely uh, slow. At the end, we reach a minimum, but the time to reach the minimum tends to be too large, and it is exponentially large as well. It's a problem, you know. So this problem, as we show, uh, so the problem of exponentially uh, or in general small gradients is related to having a, a small uh, function here. So the normalization in order to have a finite function has to go to zero exponential. Okay, when there are barren plateaus, this normalization is somehow pathological. It's not square root of m, but is uh, two to the minus m or something like this. And therefore, you see that the hypothesis of our theorems, this form, cannot be satisfied. So, okay, we are not proving that uh, with barren plateaus everything goes goes well. But the fact is that uh, L is growing logarithmically with the number of qubits. Barren plateau uh, are typically related with uh, faster growth and stronger dependencies on, uh, on the number of qubits. And so there are also some, some, some papers. This one paper by John Neff called uh, Quantifying the Phenomenon of Barren Plateaus, showing that we can somehow, for some class of circuit, bound this normalization and show that for logarithmic uh, growth, this problem, and for geometrically locally this circuit, um, this problem does not happen. And we are still in the regime of 
non trivially uh, classical similarity of the series. So there are some regimes in which, uh, in which there are no barium plateau and the, the, the circuit is trainable. Uh, is that the, yeah. Yeah. Much, much of it's like not that it's very flat, but somehow uh, the amount of flatness versus how sharp the valley is. Like, because now you're kind of saying, like, I'm tweaking my normalization, which basically means I'm learning much faster. Yeah, but, but then you can kind of overshoot. Yeah, but the, then the physical settings that they have to measure the output of the circuit is the output is really small, yeah. and they have to force it to be bigger by multiplying. It by a large constant, yes, yes. then to measure it without uh, large statistical noise, to yeah, yeah. large number of measurements, they have to perform a really large number of measurements. But because this, this is an expectation value of a, the, the, the model is an expectation value of an observable, so I have to perform several measurements here. Yeah, I, 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 so yes. Exponential yeah. to get this information out. Yes. Okay. This I understand. Yeah. No. 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 It was more general. Like the, the barren plateau itself is kind of like I can see that the biggest problem is maybe that if you have a very flat thing and yeah. then a very narrow. Yeah, it's difficult valley. to do to, to, to a random initialization. So if you initialize the circuit here, okay, but with high probability, then Not you will have many problems. So okay. Well, <laughs> Uh, so what is the result? So with a similar hypothesis as before, uh, we proved that uh, so with high probability, uh, train will be successful. This n is the number of uh, training example. So the cost function will go to zero exponentially in time, exponentially fast in time. So we will have a perfect fit of the training set. This is the lazy training because this quantity is going to zero as m goes to infinity. Uh, but this is what technical is not what we're looking for. And more important, because otherwise the result is useless, we do not have overfitting because also in the quantum case, the distribution will be a Gaussian process with a different uh, mean function, covariance, properties in general. And we can compute these. Uh, uh, Analytic, we can state what is uh, the mean and the covariance of this uh, Gaussian process. So let me just sketch an idea of the, of the proof without uh, entering in technical details. Sorry, can I ask one more? Yeah. Question? So for it not to overfit, you have to have some assumption, I presume, on the training data, right? Because if the training data is not expressive enough of the. So the, the, the assumption the we have here. Mm -hmm. Is that mm, relaxing this or studying more in general? This problem is still open. Mm -hmm. so, the training set is arbitrary, fixed. Okay. So the number of example and the dimension mm -hmm. of x, the input space, does not depend on it. Because if we want, okay. uh, yeah. the idea is that uh, when we consider larger problems, then we have to maybe add some training points or consider uh, higher dimensions and then at the same time increasing the number of fields. But now we are fixing, uh, we are fixing and, and then uh, further study could be just see how the non gaussianity depends both on the number of qubits and the number of, but if we fix, uh, once we fix one arbitrary training set, then uh, we will be able to, uh, to fit. So in the limit of an infinite number of qubits, the model will be expressive enough. My, my point was more being that the training set is kind of like, I don't know, you, uh, let's, say, let's say you have a function, but uh, in the actual set, there's like a bump. Mm -hmm. This bump is not represented in the training set. It's just yeah, okay. flat. Then, okay. then you will never learn this, right? And then you will overfit to the training set and never see this kind of bump, so. Yeah, overfitting in this case, I mean, the, we will not have os strong oscillations. Ah, okay. Then the generalization or other okay. points. Will, this will depend on, on, on the mean and the covariance of the Gaussian process. Okay. 
So uh, the idea is that uh, having a Gaussian process at the initialization and during the training uh, and fitting the training set. So at the end, we will have, a, according to our result, a Gaussian process distribution over uh, the output of the training uh, network. And this is not uh, really a consequence of the fact that the initialization <coughs> uh, distribution was a Gaussian process, because during training, this could change, and this will, for an exercise uh, case, in general change. So uh, we will see why. But the fact that it is still a Gaussian process at the end is not obvious at all uh, a priori. So uh, let us just, uh, well, I will put this notation, I will call x and y the vectorized form of the training set. As I said before, we will consider the mean squared error uh, as a cost function training using the gradient flow. This evolution equation for the parameters can be translated into an evolution equation for the output of the circuit replacing this derivative, derivative of the model. And the evolution is determined by this quantity, which is called, we call it empirical neural trajectory, it's just definition, in case you need. Uh, as you can see, this is a quantity depending on time. And it, it is called empirical because it depends on the specific parameter, and in particular, the initialization, it depends on the initial point on the parameter space. So let's try now to consider a simplified version of this evolution equation, just to understand what is the meaning. Uh, so if we ignore the dependence on time of this kernel, we have this equation. And reducing to the one-dimensional simplest case, so just this differential equation. Okay, that we perfectly know how to solve. Uh, the solution is this one. And as you can see, this is just an initial uh, term, which is exponentially going to zero. And the asymptotic result is C, which corresponds in our case to the expected uh, mm -hmm. output. So this is really a simplified toy model, but it will become relevant in a moment because now we introduce an a interesting mathematical tool. Uh, so we have the original model, which is really complicated to study and to see its evolution. But we could define, this is not what really happens in the circuit, but it's just a mathematical definition, the linearized model, which is just the first order Taylor expansion around the initial value of the parameter. And, uh, try to study the evolution equation for this uh, simplified model, simplified because it is linear. And uh, so you see this equation has precisely the form I showed before in the one dimensional case. So we know, uh, yes, because the, this coefficient is not depending on time since this uh, gradient is fixed. So, the evolution can be analytically computed. And therefore, we precisely know the output of this uh, simplified model at each uh, time. So we need just another statement that we prove that is that um, the, this uh, empirical neural tangent current converge to a uh, general uh, universal function as the number of qubit increases. And therefore, uh, this quantity in the solution will asymptotically not depend on the initial point. So graphically, we could sample different points according to our probability distribution in the manifold of the parameters and see that asymptotically, the corresponding empirical uh, neural tangent kernel becomes, <coughs> becomes closer and closer to this universal uh, function. And therefore, we, ha we have 
this quantity, not depending on the initialization, this quantity becoming a Gaussian process, so not depending on the initial parameter. And therefore, uh, yes, the output will be asymptotically universal, not depending on the initialization scheme and the, the training. So the training is fixed, but it will depend. The path will depend on the initial point. And finally, since this is a linear combination of Gaussian, a Gaussian process, it will still be a Gaussian process for this reason. And we don't compute mean and covariance for this uh, Gaussian process using this explicit formula. So this is the linearized model. The following step will be uh, to understand what happened with the original model. So we have an evolution equation for the original model and a different evolution equation for the linearized model. So this is the parameter evolving according to the linearized model. So the cost function will use the linearized model and not the original one. And so the first thing that we can prove just using this equation, not considering the linearized model, uh, is that so manipulating this equation and well, using some technical parts, but it's not really relevant to, to enter into the details. We can prove that, okay, this uh, uh, trajectory will reach a local minimum, which is a local minimum having zero error, so it is a global minimum. This global minimum, it is close, so this is R1, it is close to the initial point, and this is the lazy training, R1 will go to zero as the number of cubic will go to infinity. And uh, so a microscopic change of the parameters will produce a finite change in the function. But what about the trajectory of the linearized evolution? Well, it will be, of course, different. It will reach, uh, as we saw in the explicit formula, then uh, is asymptotically fits, fits the training set. So it will be it will it will reach a global minimum for the linearized cost. Uh, but okay, what about this discrepancy? Because we I was saying. Uh, Microscopic changes could produce macroscopic, microscopic, microscopic, microscopic changes in the parameters, will produce macroscopic changes in the function in this lazy regime, in this over parameterized regime. So, this discrepancy will produce a different model in the non linearized uh, case. The answer is no, because we can we prove that the two trajectories, the two trajectories are close enough. There is a second order discrepancy, such that uh, asymptotically, the discrepancy between the original model and the linearized uh, one will go to zero. And therefore, all the results which are valid for uh, uh, the, the linearized model in particular, for its, its distribution, probability distribution, will also hold for the original model. And therefore, we can compute this is just for t equal infinity, but we can compute it for each t, uh, the, 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 the mean and the covariance function for the trained model in the limit of an infinite number of cubic. And this is, as I said before, the cost going to zero and the lazy train. And this is just, so now we can understand this peculiar shape. But there is a final issue related to the fact that we are in this. So if the strategy is similar so far to the classical case, but with a different model and so different proof, uh, now there is another issue in the quantum case because we have an expectation value that we don't really know. We can compute an estimator this expectation value. Uh, and so we need a number of measurements. And we want to know if the required number of measurements to uh, make this perfect training 
happen uh, scale polynomially in the number of qubits or exp maybe exponentially, we don't know for the moment. So, uh, and we are considering now the discrete time setting because the physical situation in the laboratory is uh, just that we update in discrete time steps the parameters. Uh, and so we will consider gradient descent and no more gradient flow. With uh, noise into the, yeah, the finite number of measurements. So using this picture, if the blue trajectory is the cost function that we, are, we want to minimize the blue trajectory, the blue trajectory <coughs> uh, exact one without noise in the steepest direction, when we introduce some noise, many things could happen. We could be close to the original trajectory. We could also go in another direction. There maybe reach another minimum. Or we could also go in a direction which, especially when the landscape is uh, flatter than this, in a direction with, which is not minimizing the cost function, but increasing the cost function. Uh, so, what can we do heuristically? Well, do enough measurements to make the variance of this estimator small enough to be, with high probability, really close to the right direction. Uh, okay. Uh, so the graphical idea is not to compare the exact trajectory, the entire exact trajectory to the stochastic one, because this uh, is really problematic. I tried, but then it's really difficult to uh, sum all the discrepancy and the previous discrepancy and to keep taking into account all the previous discrepancies uh, as the number of steps increases. So the, the key idea is to consider at each time step the, to compare the stochastic evolution and the original evolution starting for, from stochastic uh, new point in the parameter space uh, and making the, the, also the original and evolution without noise, starting from the same point in this way. Okay, so we are not comparing the exact trajectory starting from theta zero and going to the minimum, but just requiring that at each uh, time step, the stochastic one is close enough to the deterministic one so that the cost at each time step is reduced. Is uh, reduced enough. So the role of the deterministic model here is just to ensure that uh, the cost is decreasing also for the stochastic case. And then we want to find some requirements on these discrepancy and so on the variance of this estimator. So G of T will be the estimator, unbiased estimator of the gradient of the cost function. This can be computed, uh, maybe you know, but I don't there are some strategies to compute these unbiased estimator using uh, parameter shift rules. Uh, okay. These are just techniques to make this estimator without bias. Uh, and then what we, we prove at the end is that such variance is a really complicated expression, but with a, a dependence of the, on the number of qubits, that is one over a polynomial uh, in the number of qubits. At most, this is just a, a bound that could be, could be better than this. But this means that uh, since the variance is proportional to one over the number of measurements, that the number, that a polynomial number of measures will be sufficient to make this training happen. So the final statement is that, okay, this is the variance sufficient small according to the definition I gave before, and some other technical assumptions, the model learning rate, uh, so, and the 
64 proof of the like cones with respect to the normalization, then we will have this exponential discrete time uh, convergence, lazy training, including uh, further determining uh, uh, with high probability, and then the limit of an infinite number of qubits will, will have the same Gaussian process. So same covariance and same uh, mean function, including also the probability distribution uh, due to uh, in the noise. So it will, the non-Gaussian it is introduced maybe by, by the noise will be anyway suppressed in this limit. So, okay. Uh, there could be many aspects to deepen this direction. So, first of all, problem of the normalization. Can we, there are, as I said before, there are some cases in which N of M can be computed, but more in general, is there any strategy to compute this normalization and then to understand when bar and plateau are uh, present in our situation and so are uh, hindering the um, training? Is it possible to relax the, so my hypothesis suggests the maximal degree at the initialization of uh, the dependency graph. Uh, what is the dependence with respect to the number of training examples? And since typically, okay, this band could not be reached and for sure in a real situation, we will not have an infinite number of qubits. So what is the role of uh, the non-Gaussianities? Can this help the generalization power? There are some heuristics um, about the classical case saying that when we are not completely close to the Gaussian process limit, so the limit in which uh, the kernel, which is this uh, K, the universal function, is fixed. But it still depends somehow on the training. So we are not really in the ocean case. Okay. This could improve somehow the learning, the generalization power, making this uh, kernel trainable. But this is just an heuristic argument. And uh, we, we don't really know uh, uh, a rigorous proof for the classical case, and of course not for the quantum one. And so the, the big question at the end, but just a first step, I don't know how to <laughs> this problem. Uh, what are, at the end, the problem, <coughs> relevant problem, I mean, that quantum neural network will be able to solve more efficiently than any classical algorithm. So now we know that this kind, this class of quantum neural network is efficiently uh, trainable and uh, does not overfit the training set, but okay, then the important answer would be then what are the problems that are worth to study? Okay. 